Hello and welcome to On The Road With, with me, Gareth John, your host. This is the 20th show now, and it's a show where I talk to touring professionals from the entertainment and performing arts industries about the realities of life on the road, the mental health side of it, how they got started, and much, much more. Now, with it being the 20th show today, I wanted to do something special to market, and uh, what I've put together is a best of seasons one and two, both conversations and the great music that my guests have picked uh, throughout the show so far. We're on season three now, and I just thought it was a good time to look back with it being show number 20 at some of the best bits. It was so hard to choose, so there may well be a part two to this. As ever, you can follow, subscribe, and like us wherever you get your podcast fix. If you could also leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and a rating, that would be much appreciated. It takes two seconds, and it really does help spread the word of the podcast far and wide. And you can also follow me on social media. It's Gareth John Music, where I'll be posting updates about the show going forward. All the episodes are also available on my YouTube channel, which is also Gareth John Music. And if you're liking the music you hear today and in the other episodes, you can stream that on Spotify on the On The Road With Featured Songs playlist. Now we're going to kick off today with my very first interview I ever did on this show. It was a really good one with a great friend of mine. It's Mr. Spike Munro, former guitarist in Marmalade, among other things. And we're going to talk about how he got started playing the guitar. And he also talks about the explosion in 1962 by the Beatles with uh, Love Me Do. And just not planning anything, how everything just kind of fell into place for him. He's never kind of planned anything in his career. And I thought that was quite an interesting angle. Hope you enjoy. Spike, thanks for doing this. Hi, Gareth. Uh, It's nice to be here on your which I think is your first podcast, and welcome to my man cave. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm in mine as well. It's not really a, a man cave so much as a, a dining room with a laptop and a, a few bits oh, and bobs. <laughs> as you know, um, it's uh, I'm getting into the studio experience at the minute, and it's a bit of a, as we talk about often, it's a bit of a different world, isn't it? Yeah, you've just got to work with what you've got, basically. Absolutely, which is, is kind of like being on the road. See what I did there? The link into, oh. the, uh, into, the, into the podcast. Um, exactly. So one thing you said to me, we, we talk very often and, uh, you know, often at this sort of time, it's actually quite early for us. It's half 11 at night, um, quarter to 12. Is it? No, five to 12. Is it five to 12 now? Um, by the time we got our tech, oh, it is early, yeah. by the time we got our tech brains together, um, it's, it's yeah. become five to 12. It's actually quite early for us, isn't it? Um, yeah, it is. <laughs> but by normal standards, but, um, the, uh, one thing that you've said to me on many of our calls is, uh, that you don't plan anything. Uh, things just fall into place. You've never um, set out with a particular plan in your in your career as a successful touring uh, musician no. and, and other jobs in the business as well. What do you think the advantages of that are, as as opposed to planning everything? Because I know I'm a massive planner. I, you know, I've got the to do list, and I'm always talking to you about with this goal and that aim, and I'm going to do this by yeah. then. And I'm kind of the opposite. So, what do you think the advantages of well, so, I, I so to speak, your way. Oh. I don't know about the advantages. It's just the way. It's just the way my life has panned out. I always find if I actually want something, and really want it, I've never got it. But when <laughs> I've just just sat there and done nothing, and things just happen. I mean, I don't like knowing what's ahead. Some people need security in their lives, but not me. I. I, I didn't intend to, to play the guitar or be in a band. You go back to 1962, the light programme, full of Lonnie Donegan and whatever and Pat Boone, and then suddenly this flash of light came out. The Beatles, Love Me Do. You can't imagine what that was like in 1962. Mm. I'm bouncing around the kitchen with a tennis racket. <laughs> and me, me, I was brought up by my grandparents. So my nan says, oh, look, he's got the rhythm. Uh, and I'll go, buy me a guitar. So next thing I know, my granddad's bought me a guitar. And he's paid for lessons at the local music shop in Canuck. And I, I, all of a sudden, I'm thinking, this ain't fun. But he made me practice. I think I've, about, about, by the time I was 11, that's about the limit. I've never got any better than that. But... Oh, I wouldn't say that, Spike. <laughs> I wouldn't say that. You're doing yourself a disservice there, mate. Come on. But, but you know, 11 years old, one year practising, learning, and all the parents got together, you know, all the other the kids in the class, and behind, behind our backs, 
they created a band. And next thing I know, I'm playing on the clubs at 11 years old. And absolutely. And you, and you're, and I swear, I mean, absolutely shitting myself. And you're out there in the in the big wide world of uh, of gigging and the, the good, bad and the well, ugly yeah, that, the that comes with that. Our first, there was uh, six of us in the band, and our first wages were three pound ten shillings between six of us. I remember that big payday. Uh, well, I suppose in '62 it was, <laughs> um, and we were called the Chase Beats because at the time it was the Mersey Beats. Oh, of we, course, we, yeah, yeah, of yeah, course. And I came from Canic Chase, mm. and so we were called the Chase Beats, and and that. You know, that was the start of it, really. Not planned, as we were going back to that first, you know, thing. We, that wasn't planned. I carried on um, in another band, in another band, and it just kept going, and I I didn't look for it. Um, so I guess I was just lucky. And that was Spike Munro from episode one of On The Road With. Episode one, season one. Feels like a long time ago now. And uh, as Spike said himself, the beginning of my podcast, Odyssey, as he puts it. So next up is Miss Alison Wheeler from the beautiful South originally, and more recently the South. She also works with me on my jazz projects as well, and she's somebody I've got a lot of admiration for. She was definitely high on my list when I first had the idea to do the show, and uh, in this little clip she talks about her love for jazz and the project that spurned off of that, uh, which is called Southern Beauty, and you'll hear one of their tracks at the end of this. But I, I I have always loved jazz and I was introduced to jazz through my husband many, many years ago. And as you know, I've been fortunate to work with you on your projects mm. and I just always had it niggling under my skin that I wanted to take the beautiful South back catalogue and try mm. and transfer it into a new style, a new genre, and then hopefully extend its shelf life and also expand it to a new audience, new listeners who might not necessarily go down the, the pop road of listening to pop bands from the 80s. So, um, yeah, Southern Beauty was born, and that's basically a, a three-piece, and we take Beautiful South back catalogue, along with classic jazz standards as well, and we perform them. Um, we're very early early stages at the moment. We've done a few gigs. Uh, we've got our um, kind of electric press kit ready, and we've got our website ready, and I was about to embrace the whole marketing campaign, get out, make some phone calls, meet people, shake hands. Mm. But obviously it's all been put on hold for now and who knows where that's going to go in the next few months. But um, yeah, we've we've been very fortunate and it's a talented pianist uh, called Phil Southgate and a, a, yeah, he's a good, lovely isn't vocalist, mm. a lovely mm. vocalist called Philippa, mm. Philippa Lee. And she also plays the ukulele, which kind of brings an interesting edge to it. And mm. um, they've even made me jump in and start playing the ukulele, which is a sight Way. to behold. <laughs> <laughs> So Philippa sings as well then? She's got a velvet voice, yeah. Oh, okay. Classically trained as an opera singer, but then she redis- rediscovered jazz and, and has gone down that road now. And beautiful, absolutely stunning voice. Okay, I didn't I didn't know that bit. So with Southern Beauty then, so one of the songs that you do, uh, it's one I've not heard yet actually, because I remember you sent me over some stuff when we were preparing for the um, the Christmas show at the Brook and we were looking at ideas. And you sent me over some versions of, of uh, Beautiful South songs that you guys had done, but I don't think this was one that you had done at the time or you didn't send it to me. Um, but it's, uh, well, I'll let you introduce it. So this is one of my favourites, quite a tempo and a happy song, uh, Pretenders to the Throne. Your town is dragging me down, it's dragging me down. 
dragging me down, down, down. Is it Dublin with its culture and its sweat? Madrid with its market square? Paris with its bustling cafes Or Hall with its musical flair Do you know when I'm gonna go? None of you have guessed, so none of you can know If you've been, it's not where I mean It's got class and it's got excellence like you've never seen Your town is dragging me down It's dragging me down, down, down As I watch them drop that grain into your fish tank brain How can you like this place when it never even rains? Oh, never even rains Oh, your town Pretenders to the Throne there from Southern Beauty, featuring the one and only Miss Alison Wheeler, somebody I'm really privileged to work with, and that was her talking uh, just before that about her love of jazz and a couple of other things as well. Up next is Mr Drew Stansell, a really good mate of mine. I go a long way back with Drew, back to the Paradigms days, and we've done a lot of other things together as well. Uh, he's the former sax player with the specials and the founder of Quadrophenia Night. And in this little clip, we talk about the different levels of touring and uh, the reality of the differences between the two. I suppose... The thing, one of the reasons I wanted you to to have you on the podcast, other than the fact that you're a really interesting bloke, is uh, oh, is, it, is that we've um, we've done, I guess we've experienced, and you certainly have experienced touring at the completely different ends of the spectrum. So you, mm. we've we've done the you know the early paradigms days where we're schlepping down to London for not a lot of money, if any money. Um, no money. And uh, yeah, and you you know you're doing these places to try and raise your profile and. So, you know, uh, the time that sticks in my head is the um, Brixton Hootenanny when we stopped and, you know, stayed underneath the venue. I had a really good laugh. Um, and we went on to do somewhere mm. else the next day. Mate, it might yeah. have been Fiddler's Elbow or somewhere yes. like that. And I guess yeah. as somebody who's experienced it at both levels, is there a massive amount of difference? Other than the obvious, obviously, you get paid a bit more or a lot more in some cases or a lot less, depending on um, where you are. Is there much difference, do you think, um, with the actual I, I job? Think, uh, well, um there's certainly a lot more space, isn't there? Um, when you're doing, when you've got the, the bigger gigs, you've yeah. got bigger venues, you've mm. got nicer sound. You, you, you ain't got the hassle of the hustle and bustle of the gig. I would yeah. say you, you, a good can way get away, it. you can get away from it, can't you? You can go in the dressing room, relax and chill out. Um, yeah. You've got all that with the bigger gigs. Um, when you've got the smaller gigs, and I remember, you know, when I first started touring with um, the, the Splitters. Yeah. In, the, in the late 90s and that and that was we was going to places on a tuesday night and fridays and saturdays and it was never it was really hard work it was you know mm. you, you would you would leave your house at perhaps three in the afternoon mm. to go down to norwich let's say um you have to go and pick up you have to go somewhere else to pick up the drummer and somewhere else to pick up the bass player and stuff like that and then all the equipment yeah. It's a full day, isn't it? And then you get there, you're knackered when you get there, and then you got to go and play a gig, you know. And it's, and that, that, that was, you know, talk, money was there was there was no money. Yeah. It was all for it was all for the love of, of you know of, of, for playing, and they that was they were really hard work. And like I say, there was no escape. It was in that room, you know, from from doors uh, opened until you know you, you was packing out. Mm. So you couldn't get you couldn't get away. You couldn't get out the the, the sound, and you know it was full on. 
Yeah. So that, yeah, I wouldn't want to go back to that. Really, it's, that's that's a young man's game. I think that one. Yeah, I mean, um, it's it's um, it, it's it's a lot more intense, isn't it? Because you're doing when you look at the higher level. So, like it, you would have had in the specials, and I've got in the south. You have a tour manager. You've got um, roadies. You've got a sound engineer. You've not got to worry so about easy. anything, have you? You've just got to play your no, instrument. You're just a spoiled musician, really. Yeah, yeah. You just, yeah, you just turn up, and there it is. There's your saxophone waiting for you. Yeah, yeah you used to get yours put yeah. out for you, didn't you? In the special. Yeah, <laughs> good old Punky Steve did that. Yeah, he always to, he always used to put the mouthpiece on the wrong way round, though. But I never told him. <laughs> so I thought I, <laughs> so I didn't want to upset him. Like, for years he did that. <laughs> So I just twisted it around, you know, as the least I could do, really, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I said, another thing, yeah, I do remember was, um, like, in the old days, if your mic stand or mm. your mic fell off, fell off the stand, which probably often did because it was a dodgy old mic stand, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, you'd have to stand there and pick it up and put your sacks down and things like that. But with the specials, you know, I was specifically told, if your mic falls off, then you don't touch it. You wait till someone comes on. Yeah, yeah. And, and, um, and picks it up for you, you know. And, and so you dare not touch it yeah and i remember i remember going after the specials i remember playing a gig with the atlantics and the quad night and the mic fell down and i was waiting for someone to come <laughs> on <laughs> and i looked at tom the guitar player and he, and he was like do you want me to pick that up for you <laughs> <laughs> and then i suddenly thought no 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 <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah i mean there's the there's that top level of the specials and we will go on to the, the whole specials chapter um shortly but there's the top level of the specials and then there's where the paradigms were at when we first started. Mm. You mentioned the splitters. I didn't include that actually on my list of bands for you. But, um, mm. you know, they, there's a times when you talk with El Pussycat. There's mm. there's all sorts of different things. And then there's a whole in-between level, I think, where some things are taken care of. It is fairly easy, but it's still a bit of a struggle sometimes, you know, and it's still, it's not quite arena level, but it's not quite, um, it's not quite kind of just playing around pubs, you know, it's, there's a whole kind yeah. of in-between level. And I'd put, in terms of touring, I'd put sort of the South and when I was in Stone Foundation and Neville, Neville Staple and stuff on that sort of level because everything's pretty well organised. And, and the other good thing with in terms of the with Neville is that they're a great bunch of lads. The band are a really yeah. good bunch oh, of yeah. lads. You know what I mean? Totally, yeah. You don't get any um, any bullshit on the road with them, do you? It's just a proper laugh, you know? No, that's right. And they're all quality musicians as well. It's really they are. Yeah. Lovely. It's lovely playing with them, actually. It's, it's got a really terrific band. And, and like you say, the, 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 all of them are well, you know, really lovely natured people as well. So it's dead easy. And, and, and you're right, it is well organised. Yeah. Um, everything is there. It's pretty much, you know, I wouldn't say it's te- definitely specials level mm. because that's just a bit more money on it, but it's, it's right up there. Yeah. Yeah. It's really yeah. It's kind of just, I mean, it's like I always judge it by, uh, it sounds silly, but you judge it by the rider you get in the dressing room. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you go in at a top top <laughs> the level. M&Ms. Yeah, yeah, you go in at a top top level gig, and it's all very specific. And you have got fruit in there, and you, you know mm. your spirits, and I, maybe even a bottle yeah. of champagnes in there or whatever, you know. And then you yeah. go like when we we supported with Neville, me and Spend did it. We supported UB40 at the um, Sky Dome in Cov. Right. And uh, and there, I mean, we we just got like a dressing room and I think enough for a beer each or and a bottle of water. But you mm. go went into their dressing room and it was ridiculous. You know what I mean? The you know the yeah, the, the provisions imagine, they've yeah. made for them. You know, so you have that. They're book. a large band as well, aren't they? They so are a big band. Yeah, eat yeah. a lot of grapes. Today. That's right. Yeah, yeah, a lot of champagne. <laughs> That was Drew Stansel talking about the different levels of touring that he's experienced and uh, I've been fortunate enough to experience some of those along with him as well. So up next is a really cool conversation, somebody uh, who's a great musician and been a real servant to the British jazz scene and many other genres as well actually. Uh, We talked about all sorts of stuff in this conversation, it was really hard to pick just a, a small portion of it. Um, But one of the things we talked about, which is quite relevant at the minute, is the new ways that musicians are working uh, virtually and online. Um, If you'd like to hear the full uh, conversation, as with any of these um, conversations, these snippets you hear, and if you'd like to hear the full interview, and this one with Dennis was really good, we talked about the double threat of Brexit and COVID, um, how that's going to be such a challenge for our industry and uh, many other things as well about his history and uh, and his career. So if you'd like to uh, listen to that in full, you can find that wherever you get your podcast fix. Uh, Just search On The Road With and then the name of the person, in this case Dennis Rollins perhaps, that you'd like to listen to. 
At the end of this clip, um, something that I've worked on with Dennis, it's out there in the world now, it's out on Spotify, it's on the playlist as well, on the Road With Featured Songs playlist, uh, written by King Brasted sax player Ryan West. It's a tune that we worked on together featuring Dennis, he does a blistering solo on it I must say, and it's called Out of the Shadows. I think we've got to adapt to these ways of work, whether we like it or not, uh, and there are definitely pros and cons, but I think we've got to adapt to this this way of working, you know, and um, uh, this whole virtual yeah. world that we find ourselves in, live streams, yeah. etc., you know. Yeah, it's it's a new day, and I, as you say, you know, I think I think not only the fact that we're having to adapt now, I think a lot of people are going to stand back at the end of this, take a look, and see where they can cut the fat. Mm. Obviously, mm. what we do as musicians, and and it's it's important that we we um, we're in the same space. We have to hear. Um, each other in so many different ways and and we have to connect almost physically it's kind of kind of interesting but yeah. it's a very very tactile industry in that yeah. we were very close to each other we hear the spit coming out of each other's instrument for instance yeah and yeah. we're that close but now i think a lot of people are going to be um looking at different ways of working um, at the end of this, I mean, for, for instance, it wasn't up until now that I've actually done Skype um, lessons, given Skype lessons and mm, FaceTime mm. lessons. But all of a sudden, it's a whole different approach. And I'm realizing that this can work. It's different, but yeah. it's, it's possible. So there's going to be a lot of adaptations in all sectors, I think, in all um walks of life um, to this, you know, just born of this situation. So. Yeah, I mean, it's um, it change isn't a bad thing, is it? At the end of the day, you know, you've got to embrace change it. Change will always happen. Exactly. Yeah, change is always going to happen. Everything must change as the as the song goes. It goes wrong when we think that everything's going to stay the same. Nothing stays the same.
Out of the Shadows there from ourselves and Mr. Dennis Rollins. King Brasters featuring Dennis Rollins, if you want to find that on Spotify, etc. It's also on the playlist on the road with featured songs. So, my next guest that I'm going to feature on this best of um, best of bits, if you like, from seasons one and two of the show is Mr. Taron Celli. And I try and have um, different kinds of performers on here, try and branch out from music a little bit, even though that's where I work, obviously. And Taron's a comedian, a writer, an actor... And uh, he's also one of my longest friends as well. I've known him a very, very long time. And uh, I thought this uh, this little clip here, where he defines what he thinks success is, is a really, really, uh, really, really key one. And he just hits the nail on the head for me. And uh, it was a great interview, but I thought this bit just really stood out. Um, so after I've played that, I'm going to play uh, Hayley McKay's version of Rocket Man. Now, Hayley was a bonus guest on season one of the show and you can watch the full video of our uh, interview we did it via zoom so it's full video and um you can watch that on my youtube channel gareth john music so here's a, here's taron now and then after that there's Haley mckay's great version of elton john's rocket man i've always um i look at success as being proud and happy with what you're doing every day you know it's um i've always been under the mentality that i'd rather be earning 20 grand a year and be mm. happy with my life, be mm. happy with everything, then earning hundred grand, wanting to kill myself every day. Yeah, because to me, that's not success. If you you're earning all that money and yet you don't really like what you're doing, that's yeah. not that's not successful. Success is if you're enjoying yourself. And yeah, it's obviously like you know, I'm not, and I'm not going to say, I'm not saying that if I wasn't called to do live at the Apollo, that I'd be like, no, I'm happy. No, of course I'm done. <laughs> I mean, no, I, I only want to earn twenty grand a year. Go away. Yeah, no, yeah. I'm happy where I am. Thank you very much. No, of course, I'd, I'll do it straight away. Yeah. <laughs> she packed my bags last night pre-flight. Zero hour, nine a.m. And I'm gonna be home. As a kite by then I miss the earth so much I miss my wife It's lonely out in space On such a time
Hayley there with Rocket Man, her fantastic version of that song. Really love Hayley's voice and it was a pleasure to have her on the show. We're now on to season two of On The Road With and uh, I always wanted to start season two with a real corker of an interview and uh, I certainly got a character for it. He's a great character. Mr Roy Ellis, um, a.k.a. Mr Simrip, a.k.a. The Boss. Um, he is a reggae icon and has got a massive following all over the world. I'm privileged to have played in his band, his UK band. Uh, he's always a really entertaining, funny guy and uh, this occasion was no different. Um, I, I jet around the world and don't know the countries. You know? <laughs> No, I really don't know, you know. Yeah, I just jet yeah. in and jet out the next day. You can ask me anything about the airport, I can tell you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Where's where's the where's the fragrance shop in the airport? <laughs> <laughs> I want to check it out. I need to check out the airport. All is the same, nothing different. The yeah. All is all is the same shit, the same procedure. Yeah. You can't talk about it, you know, the same old shit. So that's all I can tell you. But the country, I know from the hotel to the to the venue. And from the venue to the airport, so driving to the airport, I can see a little piece of the country by driving to the airport. Yeah, yeah. But otherwise, don't don't ask me, don't ask me nothing about those countries. I don't know. You know, that's it. One gig back, and the next day is very tiring, very boring. You know, and especially I'm older now. Yeah, yeah. You know, you, you know, age big, doing a big role of like this now. You know, you get all the playing, your foot, your your legs swollen up because you're sitting down the whole time. You don't mm. move. Mm. I got to wear stiff stockings and all them things to keep my, you just don't get thrombosis and all yeah, that. Yeah, keep, keep the circulation going, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah you yeah, know, yeah. and drink a lot of coffee and, you know, there's a way I don't like coffee, but I got to drink it to keep the circulation going and so on. Mm. So it's that, you know, and so many places, uh, they, so many places they paid and some some can't pay, mm. you know, mm. you know, and, you know, I think. I got a lot of gigs in Switzerland. They're the other, the, the other, um, the other side of me because in Switzerland I don't, I'm not really known mm. as a reggae artist here. You know, I'm a soul guy. I mean, in Switzerland, I'm a gospel and soul and blues and jazz. Yeah, yeah. Everybody know me as this and sing with big bands and all that sort of stuff. They only know about it. This kid is, didn't know I was living here till 2005. Yeah, they found out. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, so when I see any concert, or they, they, and Switzerland only book me like maybe every two years because the country is so small. It's why you see the same people every time you perform. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, so it's, when I see any concert, or they, they, and Switzerland only book me like maybe every two years because the country is so small. It's why you see the same people every time you perform. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's it's it's, um, it's probably not the kind of um, it's not the kind of big area for skinhead music and, and reggae. No, music, no, really, you it? have skinheads here, but they go outside of Germany. Yeah, yeah, things, yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. And when I have concert, I tell you, when I do concert here, um, get uh, when I do concert here, the place is packed, so they have no place to take in the people. Mm, you know, mm, mm. and it that's been paid properly, but I don't want to do it because otherwise, you know, you know, it's not the money. I don't want to be burnt out. Yeah, yeah, it was easily you done. Know? It's e- it's 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 easy to get burnt out, you know. Yeah, of course, you see the same people at the while, and they can they are, they almost can check. They know exactly what's going to come the next song. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I remember I remember when we did the hundred club. Um, uh, yeah. You you said you said to me uh, you said to me after the the show you said right I'm going to leave it. Two and a half, three years now before I come back to the Hundred Club because it's just you can't you can't overdo the same place. You, no, you can't no. Just keep with, going and going, you know. Yeah, that's stupid because I mean, you you have to play those songs. Yeah. Because that's your, your, it's, the, it's the actual. If you bring if you bring in the new ones, it might go it goes on okay. Yeah. But it's not the same like when you bring the one the actual one where people know. Well, that that's what people have paid to come and see, haven't they? They've come to see. They want to see the whole Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just imagine I've been on the stage and and done those skinny and girl and skinny moon stamp. Doesn't matter how fantastic the band play, mm. and doesn't it doesn't matter how, how fantastic man performance, <laughs> something's still missing. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. You got to put skinny girls, skinny moon stamp, stay with them. You got to drop them in. It, 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 that's what started the skinny scene. Of course, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. Of course, that's it, that, that's what started. The, these are the songs that started the, the new wave stuff, what they call it, and this and them knows mm. what they knew, you know. Yeah. So, you know, so, uh, you know, 
so that's why so here in Switzerland, as I said, it's very limited. But I've got a lot of gigs because you know I, you know I'm, I've done a lot of gospel. I got a choir and everything. Yeah. Quiet, quiet, quiet right now because there's nothing going on. So it's, they, it's, I split them up because they keep asking me when is the next gig and so on and uh, <laughs> yeah. from them nothing and they, you know because the gospel scene a little bit quiet down here now. Yeah, yeah. I do a lot of weddings and all of a sudden a lot of funerals of, for the gospel. You it, know, for the gospel scene. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it's all got, it's dying down now. Mm. It's gonna come back, but it's right now it's very quiet and because of the court. I've got this year a lot of weddings where they're supposed to do. They have all been cancelled. Mm, or move move to next year. A lot a lot of the gigs I've I've got of, of uh, yeah the festivals. Well, you're young, stuff, you see, they, you know. you're still young, you see. But I'm getting old. Every year I'm getting old, and pretty soon I'm, I won't be here anymore. You know. <laughs> oh, don't say that, Roy. Don't say that. God, yeah, you'll still you'll still knows, be you'll still be jumping around that stage, mate. You'll still be jumping well, around that stage. Uh, yeah, as a ghost, yeah, as a ghost. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Roy Ellis there, the legend, uh, talking about a variety of different things there, his career in Switzerland, um, how it's important not to play the same places over and over again, and a few other things as well. It was a great pleasure to have uh, Roy on the show. For season two, um, the bonus episode, actually, of season two, I had the lovely Mr. Nick Corbin on, a really good guy, and um, somebody who's been in the music industry a long time in various guises. He was the founder and singer-songwriter of New Street Adventure, and he's since launched a solo career, which is going really, really well for him. So here I talked to him about um, putting your own tours together, um, how you have to hire your own venue sometimes and the pitfalls, and the, but the potential benefits of that and a couple of other things as well. And then I play one of his uh, singles, Long, Long Gone, from his latest album, Sweetest Escape, um, just after that.
Corbin there with Long Long Gone. Uh, you can stream that on Spotify and you can buy it online as well. It's a great album, uh, Sweetest Escape. Really, really enjoyed listening to that one throughout lockdown and uh, I wish Nick all the best with his uh, forward-moving solo career. So next, uh, I've got a, a long-time uh, face of the Leicester music scene, uh, Mr Gaz Bertels. He's played with uh, the Beautiful South, obviously, uh, Fun Loving Criminals and many others, uh, both as a sax player and now as a vocalist as well. Um, so we talked a little bit about the... Uh, post-lockdown world and how it might look for for live music and musicians. Uh, We then moved on to kind of how the record industry works today and uh, he kind of compared that to to back in the day when he was sort of coming up and uh, how massively uh, different it is. After that, we've got a bit more music, and it's from the Swinging Laurels, which Gaz was the front man and uh, one of the main songwriters of. Uh, he wrote Lonely Boy with um, his compadre, longtime compadre, Mr. John Barrow, uh, the author of How Not to Make It in the Pop World, who uh, is the next guest after that track as well. So we'll have Gaz, uh, Gaz's little clip, um, Lonely Boy from uh, from both of them, from the Swinging Laurels, and then there'll be uh, John's little clip talking about his book and how he put that together. Um, how do you think the um, landscape is going to look? coming out of this uh, out of this lockdown you've been at the cold face of it um dealing yeah. with uh, rescheduling and cancelling and let it keeping us all in the loop of what's going on in the band and and the rest of it how do you think it's going to play out god no it's it, it was bad uh generally i think it's been it was bad anyway up, up until this you know it's been slowly dwindling the live music scene and yeah, but now it's it, it's it could go either way, couldn't it? I think it's like it's either disappear a bit more and people won't have the money to come out. To, you know, well, there's that factor, yeah. Years, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, which is yeah. a big thing, especially on our circuit where it's quite an expensive ticket, really. It's uh, yeah, or it could go the other way where people say, Sod it, I've been locked in for you know, a few months, I'm gonna enjoy life now and and hopefully come out and sort of see some live music again and, and get thrilled about seeing live music, which is uh. Yeah, I say I, I felt it sort of went. We've seen that with, with our figures, definitely. Mm. Um, uh, even though you know when we do it, great, we know it's great. 
Um, but you know the figures aren't massive. No, no. Um, uh, but acts on the you know the big acts will always be big. Yeah, <laughs> Where it's, yeah. it's the ones in, on, on the bottom and then on the way up, which is uh, not not so easy, is it? Yeah, I mean, uh, 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 you know, as for local things, you know, like you know, we're seeing now sort of you know um, crowdfunding for Sound House in Leicester, mm, mm. and I, I presume and the Donkey, you know. Yeah. Poor old Blink and everyone, they just took over the donkey and I know, uh, I know. thrust into this. So yeah, yeah. hopefully there'll be a lot of things where people will, you know, put their hands in the pocket and uh, do a bit of, you know, el- helping them out. You know, Otherwise, if if those places go, what have we got to look forward to when we come out of all this? You know? Well, that's right. And what, yeah. what's, you know... The, the the next generation down of bands i mean it's quite good for for easy life for example that they've they're they're already far, far along enough Fair that well, hopefully yeah. hopefully yeah. they're going to be able to and and they're great on the digital side aren't they they're really spot on yeah, what they put yeah, out no, you know yeah um you know and, but it's still but it's still work and and it's only and, and don't forget you know they they've got you know a backing of a record label which yeah, is yeah. you know helps, obviously helpful whereas you know just normal Fans are oh aren't signed. You know, to get all that sort of digital presence is is not as as easy as you think. You know, as, as everyone would be doing it, and, and everyone would be having those hundred thousand hits. You know, it's uh, yeah, absolutely. That, 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 that doesn't come cheap. You know, what I mean? no, it doesn't. And it, it it's not just uh, money. Obviously, you do it does take an investment, but it's also know how and time. Yeah, you know, yeah. It, it's very time consuming. I was watching um, a YouTube vid last night on. Uh, on this sort of stuff, you know, releasing uh, how best to digitally release stuff and maximise a single release in the in this day and age and all that, and mm. it just it's a massive time investment. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, this guy was talking about all these different jobs you got to do, and each one of them I know from either experience or what people tell me is it like a three four hour job, and there was loads of them. You yeah. know, it's, it's a full time job. Well, it's, it's and 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 people like Is Life and Haley and all, all, all these mm. acts are signed up. It, they're not doing the no, doing no. It all the time. You know, there's a there's a team behind them at the record label, and that's their job, you know, twenty four seven, yeah, to look after the social medias of of all their acts and and to see what the next phase is and to see you know the new things that are coming along and to understand them and to have a foot in the door. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's 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 massive. You know, because I me- I remember I said. Uh, Spoke to Island Records once. I said, you know, how do record labels get their money? You know, mm. it, it, in our day, it was all about, you know, if you sold a record, that's where the record that's label the got their yeah, money. Yeah, yeah. That's where that's where their money is. And and they says it's all in streaming. And I said, well, really, or Spotify and all that. I said, yeah, don't believe what all, all the musicians put on on Facebook about not earning any money from it. Yeah. So there's there's a load of money per million, which okay, but the music musician doesn't see it or because mostly they they're still owing the record label they're, money they're, back they're paying the know? advance back yeah that's yeah. right yeah, yeah and that and that all comes out of streaming so they they probably won't they don't see that streaming income i still think live shows and touring are a currency you know they're still it's still worth something to do that um, definitely yeah yeah you know that old school thing of build we, i've talked to you before about the jewelers you know they go around and they've just and yeah, they've got a good yeah. they've got a good web presence but they're not a signed act um, but they've they've charted and they've also got a big following all around. The, you know, they can pack places in Glasgow and they're from down yeah. south uh, with a thousand people. You know, it's no mean feat off your own back. That's right. And, and if you're at that level, like with this with the south, okay, our audience is a, quite a lot older mm. generally. So they're not going to buy many t shirts, let's be fair. No. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Those skinny rib t-shirts they ain't going to put them on. <laughs> and, uh, so, so yeah, so merchandise-wise, you know, we're not one of the best ones to look at. But but if you're a young up-and-coming band, you know that that flies off the shelf at every gig. You know, mm, so mm. and that's you know that's a big profit. You know, each time. So well, our support so, yeah. bands sell more more merch than we do, don't they? Most of the time. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah I remember. Uh, Daydream, I think they sold like eighty CDs one 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 gig, and we yeah. sold about two. Yeah, I know, <laughs> I know. Yeah, it's it's funny.
I've always wanted to write a book, but I'm not a literary person. I'm not that great, you know. I'm not <laughs> well yeah. read, you yeah. know, quite well read. Uh, but yeah, you know, after years of touring and um, all the anecdotes and the on the road little tales and stories, I, I always remembered them to some of them. Yeah. Uh, I thought one day I'm going to, you know, sit down, unveil all of this stuff, you know, to the outside world and that's it you know just just really from on the road stories and studio stories and the rest of it well if only there were a podcast you could talk about all this stuff eh, john i beg pardon <laughs> i said if only there was a podcast you could talk about all this stuff <laughs> well <laughs> on yeah, the road and yeah. you've got to be careful what you say so <laughs> well the, that's the it pub, our, our, my publisher is well they were taken originally with they were, they were canadian this new edition of the book uh, I've had to take out a few things that were in the original edition of the book, yeah. and, and I think it's purely because uh, Americans are a bit litigation, you know, obsessed in some sort of ways. But uh, but yeah, yeah, we've come to a compromise, and uh, we're there now, and it's all out there and ready to go. Oh, good stuff, good stuff. Yeah, it's it's one thing I've found doing these interviews is that. Um, it, there's that famous phrase, isn't there? What happens on the road stays on the road. Uh-huh. And um, and there's um, and there, there's that famous kind of phrase, isn't there? What happens on the road stays on the road. And um, you you know you're talking to people, and I really want to get the kind of juicy stuff, you know, and and the great stories <laughs> and stuff that they might tell me uh, privately. But then you know when it comes to the podcast, understandably, there's some things they go, uh, yeah, I'm going to leave that out. And there, there's quite a few times where people say, I won't name names, but. Or I won't say what the venue was, but you know, and that that kind of thing. And I've done it myself in interviews, and and um, but it is great that you that you want to put the, these uh, these things out there because I think touring is kind of shrouded in a bit of a a kind of bubble that people think it's one thing, and actually the reality of it is quite different. Totally different. Totally different. I would say though, Gareth, you know, like as to what you can put in there and what you can't put in there. Yeah, you know, I agonised for ages and ages. There were certain things I thought, oh, if I put that in, it's gonna, <laughs> that's gonna really upset a few. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So you think, oh, you water it down. I thought, oh no, leave it out. You know, uh, but yeah, yeah, you, you're dead right. I, you, you, you know, you've got to be a bit careful what you do say. You know, because you don't want to upset people, and you know, you've got friends and relationships and their relationships, and you think, well. You know, and you just got to sort of just do about right. John Barrow there talking about his uh, his book, How Not to Make It in the Pot World, and uh, well worth a read. I'll definitely check that out if you get a chance. So we're coming to the end of the best bits of seasons one and two now. Obviously, you can check out season three as well. That's uh, wherever you get your podcast fix, it will be there. It's also on my YouTube channel as well, all the episodes in full, some with full video as well. And I've had some great guests on season three as well. So... I'm going to do something a little bit different with uh, my final uh, clip for today. Uh, it's Miss Carol Leeming. Uh, she's a polymath, a multidiscipline creative, really, really inspiring person and uh, somebody I get on really, really well with. I've uh, been around the Leicester scene a long, long time and has had really big success as well in the charts, etc. But I'm not going to play something from her interview on the podcast. I was actually uh, fortunate enough to interview her on Windrush Day on uh, my radio show on Radio 2 Funky. That's on a Monday, 2 till 4, 95 FM or on their website. And it was one of my first radio shows. I think it was my very first one, actually. And it was a real pleasure to talk to Carol about something obviously very close to her heart. Um, So I thought I'd drop that in there as well. Um, Just something a little bit different. But her interview on the podcast was also equally as interesting. So you can check that out as well. Carol, thanks for joining me. I wanted to ask you what your personal connection to Windrush is, because it's one of the many things, well, one of the few things I should say that we've not discussed, because we've talked about most other things over the time we've known each other. Yes, well, thank you. It's lovely to be uh, talking here with you. Well, my own personal connection, uh, my mother and father were Windrush generation. They came here, they met in Leicester and got married. But my mother also sent for two of her nephews, Earl Robinson and her nephew, Noel Robinson, who were kind of young guys who came from Jamaica. And Mm. what was so fantastic is they came from Jamaica, they came to Leicester, they just missed... Uh, being signed up for the army that that right. had just passed oh, okay yeah and as soon as they got here they started buying jamaican music and mm. american music r&b from the 50s and early 60s mm. and so i grew up in 
with that music all around me. So they used to go to the docks to buy records from Jamaica and America, you know, to get the releases because they couldn't get them in the shops in Leicester. Yeah. And so that's why I'm a musician. I was surrounded by uh, American R&B and um, early uh, Jamaican music and the very early um, Mento and Scar and all this sort of thing growing up. Yeah, and so I, I I owe them a huge debt, really. The the, the Windrush generations. I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think it was also not just not just the music from those places like the Jamaican music, but mm. also I know that my mum always talks about because my um uh, my auntie was married to a Jamaican guy first, uh, her first mm. husband, and and he bought mm. in all the Otis Redding records and That's all right. that kind of stuff, which That's right. we, we might have known about, but it's obviously before the age of the internet. It's not as easy That's to know right. about these overseas stars and, and, all, and all that. So Yeah, and, and I should also add that my father had Miles Davis, Billie Holiday, Cannonball, mm. Adderley, mm. and all this was in the house. And, you know, he had this big radiogram, you know, we had a radiogram. And yeah. so, you know, growing up, there was music around me. There was jazz, there was American R&B, and there's all this Jamaican music so it kind of seeped into me really yeah it would do it would do I mean we'll we'll, um uh, I was I was going to talk about the sort of music side of things uh, a little bit later but that's a really sort of nice nice way to cover it but it sounds like that was kind of the main the 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 lasting thing that you take from the Windrus generation absolutely well one of the lasting things Mm. I take from from them certainly the music had such a such an impact me uh, uh, impact on me growing up obviously it had a huge impact on the wider society yeah and talking of wider society i mean i think one thing that shocked me doing the research for this interview um is that the that generation obviously you can't really talk about windrush day i don't think it, you wouldn't be right talking about it if you don't talk about the the recent scandal um, yeah. in relation to it and now while we yeah. while we're not a particularly political station I'm mm. allowed to express my own view, and I thought it was it was yeah. really disgusting what happened, and yes. and it was buried by Brexit now COVID. Yes, it's always yes. kind of been put to one side, and and what's what yes. uh, what's forgotten is that so many of that generation have contributed massively. We've just talked about yes. one tiny element, which is music, but yeah, you know they've contributed massively in the NHS in it, what jobs that yes. we now class as key workers in this current pandemic. Yes. That's right. Yes. You know, yes. and it's and it's um it's always kind of overlooked. I don't know if if you feel that as well, but my, my well, personal it, opinion is it's always overlooked. It is always overlooked, and it is um they've made a massive contribution, as you say, NHS transport. You could go on and on, mm, really, mm. in terms of um you know they talk about you know the fifties Britain being on its knees. You know, I think when my mum and dad were here, there were still Russian books and things like that. Economically, yeah, yeah, yeah. things were so low after the yeah, war. The war. So yeah. they did. They did make a massive economic um, contribution, but they were never really, um, you know, really sort of uh, credited for that. And of Mm. course, there was terrible racism that Mm. they had to uh, contend with also at at that time. So, yes. And the Windrush scandal is appalling, you know, for people who've been here for decades, raised their families, bought houses, paid their tax and to be, you know, given a a letter that says you've got to go back to Jamaica or wherever that you've never been there for 30, 40, 50 years. And people did die with the shock and people also faced nhs bills because all of a sudden they were classed as some sort of alien and a lot of it was governmental responsibility you know some people had um you know couldn't find their paperwork for years and years but of course everyone that came to this country there was a record when they disembarked off a ship and that's Mm. in the national records office so it was a terrible terrible scandal and and a lot of those records were actually destroyed in 2010 as well that's right that's right um, and, that, and that's a bit of the story that. that doesn't get told isn't it no no it was quite cruel and callous in my view to do that knowingly destroy records that you know that they're, they're statistics but they're individual people's lives they're somebody's grandmother somebody's grandfather mm. brother sister uncle aunt and and it was just shocking and even now the so-called compensation scheme has has, has hardly paid out what it's supposed to so it's still an ongoing scandal as far as i'm concerned yeah, I mean, you get the odd politician who flies the flag for it. So, you know, David Lammy um, very much yeah. describes himself as a proud son of the Windrush generation. Um, yeah. And he's really fought fought the case on it and commissioned a review mm. and all that kind of stuff. But I think it's, uh, 
I mean, throughout mm. the whole Brexit process, I was sharing on social media here, mm. you know, mm. every, every opportunity I got, I saw something yeah. because I just thought, you know, we, we're wrapped up in other mm. things and this has just been parked to the side. Mm. Yes, yes, I agree. Absolutely. And, and um, is, is there a lot of kind of, because looking at the figures, um, you know, you had you had kind of 15,000 um, from J- the, the people who are affected, you had 15,000 from Jamaica, um, mm, 57,000 mm. total. You've got 13,000 mm. from India, which I didn't realise. Mm, um, mm, and mm. I, I can, you know, re- relate to mm. that with some of my friends mm. and their, their parents. Um, mm. Is there much kind of discussion and solidarity around the different cultures that came in around that time, especially in a place think, like Leicester? I think there was because, again, it's... Black history is something that I've always had a, an avid interest in mm, and maintained. Mm. So I've listened to what my parents and, and other elders in my community said. So somewhere like Highfields, for example, mm. um, was always an area for immigrants. So, you know, you go back to the Edwardian Victorian times, you had Chinese, you had Polish, you had, uh, you know, Jewish immigration there. Right, so yeah. when you when you get to the Windrush generation, you've got black and Asian people able to get cheap rented accommodation in Highfields because it was difficult to get rented accommodation anywhere else in the city and and i think uh people worked side by side in Mm. factories both my parents worked in factories and they worked side by side with gujarati with sikh people with bengali people so there was that you know and there were unions and people knew each other through work but also for me growing up in the 60s you know i grew up in a school with bengali sikh gujarati Mm. um children and my whole life that which i've lived in leicester because i've lived in other places you know there, there, there was solidarity and i can give evidence of that in mm. particularly in the um in the 80s when leicester had riots and we were battling the national front mm. you know there was incredible solidarity in resisting the national front coming into places like highfields and there were political organizations you know usually quite left-wing socialists mm. where we all work together in solidarity and also we always work together if any Asian or black person was killed in custody or arrested unjustly or died in a mental home you know we would actually organize together defense campaigns and we also had a law center Highfields and Belgrave Law Center which provided legal rights for Mm. people so there was an awful lot of solidarity. I wasn't aware of a lot of, a lot of that. It's something that, that doesn't yeah. um, get talked about um, as, no. as as much as as you might think. Yeah. And uh, and I didn't know that you know the the uh, Windrush generation. Yes, majority it was um, those from the Caribbean. But there were yes, there's been there's there been other others. there you know there's been other cultures that have really been um, broken apart yes. by by this. Yes, um, it's by, terrible by the scandal. So um, yes, so yeah, I mean. So we're on Windrush Day. Um, well, when this goes out, we'll be on Windrush, Windrush Day. Mm. And um, there's a lot of celebrations that happen over the years. There was a, mm. um, a model of the of the ship Empire Windrush at mm. the uh, 2012 Olympic Games, mm. um, and and quite a lot of uh, sim- quite symbolic, be- uh, big kind of gestures like that. Do you mm. do you think there's anything more that could be done um, to celebrate well, it? What- yes, I do. And 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 one of the things that I have a problem with the way the wish- Windrush they came about it was kind of a knee-jerk reaction by Theresa May's government mm. and they 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 then said well you know let's celebrate it it's going to be June the 22nd and actually I don't think they did enough in terms of key messaging nationally about Windrush what it is why we're celebrating it to the wider uh, society yeah. and then the second point was they um, wanted national celebrations up and down the country and they gave about five quid for it, the equivalent of, mm. you know, in, 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 in ratios and percentage. I mean, they gave a pitiful amount uh, in a pot of money for people in the community or even local authorities to be able to uh, apply to, mm. uh, to organise. And not only that, people didn't have the information that they knew that, you know, to know that there was a pot of money. And so what you had in places like Leicester last year was people sort of heard about it at the last minute and a few people applied but didn't get really get anything. Mm. And also what was so annoying, and Leicester suffers from this a lot, is when when that pot, pot small, tiny pot was handed out, yeah, it went to Manchester, it went to Birmingham, it went to Bristol. It, yeah. you know, it didn't come anywhere near Leicester or even Nottingham, I don't think. And so, 
as far as I'm concerned, that needs to be increased and there needs to be more key messaging from government and nationally to the country as a whole mm. in terms of celebrating um, Windrush Day. Because I can tell you now, there's still a lot of people in all the communities who don't know the date, they don't know when it happens and they don't know, they still don't know why, why are we celebrating Windrush yeah, I mean, it, absolutely. The, the people like your, your kind of David Lammies and, and people like that, I suppose there's a small number of um, the next generation uh, from what from Windrush who are actually mm. in Parliament and could make a difference. And some of them yes. have spoken up, but, um, but yes. you know, it's, it's a, I guess it's a long battle. It's not going to be won overnight. It, it, it will be a long battle. And, and the other thing that's important, I think, to mention when we talk about Windrush, especially... Um, one of the things that we need to also understand is the contribution of what was then called Commonwealth soldiers mm. from the Indian subcontinent and from uh, the Carib African Caribbean um, soldiers from the Caribbean is their contribution to First World War and the Second World War. Mm. And so one of my dad's friends, in fact, a few of my dad's friends of Windrush generation, the first people to come to Leicester were often um, servicemen. And then right. the others came afterwards. Right. So the servicemen were here before, you know, from after the war um, time. So people sometimes forget that. And some of the younger generations still don't know about the contribution of, um, you know, soldiers from the Asian subcontinent and from uh, the African Caribbean islands in the Caribbean for both both First, world, first and Second World War. Yeah. And that's still not celebrated enough, or remembered, or, or commemorated. Yeah, I, th I think the only um, the only kind of commemoration of that I've seen is in the uh, Newark Houses Museum. Mm. Um, yes. They've got a section in there, haven't they, about it? Yeah, Tara Munro and um, also another chap who's um, named uh, Tzampa, the guy who runs the Equestrian Academy. Um yeah. He and Tara have both been uh, actively uh, organising, you know, around black soldiers in both world wars. And I know that um, the guy who has the Equestrian Academy, I have bought a black poppy from mm, him. Mm. Um, and I know that Tara has been involved uh, with the Leicester Race Equality um, uh, Council in, in curating an exhibition. Yeah. So it yeah. might be that exhibition has got a permanent home now and the museum which would be good yeah that'd be fantastic well carol mm. thank you so much for for the discussion on that i'll be i'll be talking to some uh some younger generation people actually as well to try and get a bit Excellent. of balance on this so be interesting yes. to see what they say and um thanks so much for coming on thank you thank you for asking me thank you so that's it the best bits of seasons one and two of on the road with thank you so much for joining me today and also if you've tuned into any of the episodes so far in all three seasons it really does mean a lot um, I'll be cracking on with season three from next week. I've got some really exciting guests in the pipeline for the final two episodes of that. I'll be taking a short break and I've got some new shows on the way actually as well. Some more um, specific themed shows. So I'll be keeping you up to date on that. You can keep up with all the updates on social media. It's Gareth John Music. And I'm going to play the show out now with um, one of my upcoming singles actually for next year. Uh, first time this has been uh, sort of put out into the world and it will be released early 2021. It's called Don't Let It Go. Take care now. Bye-bye. Yesterday up on the mill He's working to the bone So hard it seems He can only dream of how The goal could be Achieved, but not with ease. But is it worth the price he pays or fees? Will he be too old that he does not know? Don't let it go. Mm -hmm. Don't let it go. on the edge of 
things he never dared to dream would ring so true. Mm. As close as is to what he loved, reality hits and beats him black and blue. Yeah.